Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this morning is taken from our gospel reading, Luke 5, the theme being a calling like Peter's, we pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Dear saints, brothers and sisters, even disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, once upon a time Jesus called his apostles, men like Andrew, James, John, and Matthew, and of course Peter. Clearly such men were special according to their office, and that is what I'd like to concentrate on today. Many times we like to make comparisons to their calling and ours, that somehow we are all disciples, and that's true enough, but I'm going to correctly expand upon the apostles' unique calling. It is our text, and why? Because of the great work which they alone could do in their time at the turn of a new era and with the coming of the New Testament, we now benefit from their labors. Again, most of the time we're tempted to think Jesus also calls us to gather people into his church, just as they did, perhaps in great numbers as well. But that's just not the case. So we're not to beat ourselves up when we don't produce the same results by the grace of the Holy Spirit as did they. According to their calling, those apostles, at the founding of the church, no less. Not I, nor the sainted Reverend Dr. Merlin Ream, who would of course also have emphasized the, emphasized the importance of the mission that was given to those first disciples those many centuries ago, and from a very well-versed academic point of view, I'm sure with some Greek thrown in there somewhere, I'm sure. So again, here we have Peter, who is endowed with first and foremost the very presence of Jesus. He and the apostles essentially hear firsthand from the mouth of God. They know the sound of his very voice. And with their three years worth of experience literally at the feet of Jesus, it comes to no surprise that Jesus imparts to them unique gifts of the Spirit for ministry, real power, the ability to heal, no less, cast out demons, etc. Peter and the other disciples did not need to stick to designated congregations and pulpits, therefore, either. They could affect people publicly, and in a way, no one could deny the good that they were doing. They didn't just speak words which were, of course, radically exclusive to giving glory to Jesus alone as the true God. They cured people, healed them of their diseases as well, fed them, showed them how God loves them. We are content to preach in a corner at present circumstances. As they force us to, in a way, we cannot preach in a fully public forum. It's Politically incorrect, to say the least, if not a legal requirement for us today to uh, go about our faith in an organized way, privately. Whereas Jesus and his disciples would not do things behind closed doors only. Yes, they were still persecuted for such radical teachings, but believe it or not, they were freer than we are now free by the means and gifts of the Spirit that God had bestowed upon them for mission and according to their office and ability, they spoke words of life. Not just in terms of promise, but in real terms that they could see and in which people could continue to put their hope. A child being raised from the dead, one of many examples, revealed to everyone around that, yes, Jesus must be the Lord both of death and life. The salvation of the world must truly have come. Yet even for them, Jesus has come and gone in a way. He's ascended to his throne, remember. What remains is the church. But he ensures that the foundation is set well 
and that the witness of tens of thousands will set a good foundation for hundreds of years to come. And so here we are. So Jesus not only goes to the cross for our salvation, he also calls the apostles and after them pastors who are not apostles, though we like to think we are, don't we? Also that the word of the cross, however, more importantly, would go out into the world constantly. Harder is a relative term, to be fair, but we don't have the gifts that the apostles had. When they started the church for Christ, but we still need to preach the same word and to back it up, back up this radical concept that there is only one God and he is in the person of Jesus without any other supernatural helps, backups. How do we do it? That's a question I ask myself every week. We have his word. That's it. But that is enough. Jesus was already predicting this time when he said to Thomas, Yes, you believe because you've seen. And that is a good thing, by the way. But blessed are those who will believe and never really get the chance to see. Ever. Not evidentially, as you got the chance to do. For that time would certainly come and is surely here. It's not that God wouldn't be proven in his word, in Jesus, in everything he said. It's that it's already been done. He's already proven it to his disciples once upon a time. And we need to trust in their word as we do in any historical document to be valid and accurate. And there's no more historical document that is more necessary and important to be sure of. And people knew that, and that's why they ensured it was passed down accurately, recorded, copied, etc. Through the apostles, the first-hand witnesses, that is a technical term, passed down through the centuries, having recorded the truth, they saw Jesus rise from the dead. Having seen him die, truly die. Neither one a hallucination, both real. Those who spoke ate with him before and after. Dedicated their lives to him. Did miracles in his name. And eventually died for this message. For his sake. Because it is all true. These are the ones who have conveyed to us everything Christ gave to them. To think that they came from such humble beginnings as well. It's awe-inspiring. Peter, a fisherman, again as we're told from our text, tired from a long day's work from our gospel reading, perhaps a bit of a, a rough fellow we like to think sometimes. But what does he do? He listens to Jesus, and not just to the request which Jesus makes to lend him his boat, whereupon he finds out quite quickly that he's going to preach, uh-oh, <laughs> to a bunch of people, who knows what was going through his head at that point, right? Uh, but then to hear Jesus uh, try to give him advice as well after that, an, an experienced fisherman, the audacity, apparently Peter had patience for him even then. For he reacts favorably upon this request as well. And that's good listening skills right there. Again, perhaps Peter was thinking to himself, though, a little bit, if I can prove this Jesus wrong, you know, put him on his ass for being a poor fisherman and telling me what to do and show nothing for it, you know, maybe he'll leave me alone. <laughs> I'll never have to deal with him again. But really the key here is, he does follow the command of Jesus. And he even adds, at your word, I will let down the nets. Right? Tell me when. I think that's significant too. And so the one who spoke right, on the fifth day of creation, which created the fish, 
in the sea brought these fish to Peter's net. And the catch was big enough to break uh, the nets and nearly sink the boats. And so another thought wells up in Peter's mind, I think, because this is, this is what would well up in my mind, my heart and my soul. I said to myself that if he fell on his ass, I would say to myself again, I know better. I said if he failed, he'd never be able to lecture me again and I wouldn't have to let him into my boat. Now I'm going to follow him forever. He's undone me. He's undone even my thoughts. What else can I do? How can I resist such a man? Peter in this catch of fish may not yet see the whole Jesus, but he knows he now has this claim on him. And this great catch of fish was just going to be the beginning. Peter was afraid. Who wouldn't be? His life was about to change forever. It didn't matter that he was standing in the middle of a huge pile of flopping fish. Perhaps one jumps up and slaps him in the face in a reality check. But all he can see now is the face of Jesus standing before him. Can you imagine? Well, of course you can't, because we just weren't there. We didn't witness it, right? That's part of the point. That's part and parcel of the unique gift that was given to Peter and the other apostles. And there's more. Though they've been in the middle of the sinking boat, Peter falls down on his knees at Jesus' feet and begs him, depart from me. I am unworthy for this calling. I am a sinful man, O Lord. Would you or I have done that? Another virtue, humility. You might have think he'd have other things on his mind as well. As a fisherman, like how many of these fish I can make profitable, right? It's a huge catch. An experienced fisherman, he's not really afraid of sinking at all. It's a matter of how many fish he's going to waste. But of course, that isn't the point either at all. As would happen again and again, instead of being afraid of dying, he'd be afraid of Jesus all the more. Afraid of his power, afraid of his holiness, and therefore, as a religious man, rightly so, afraid of his holy wrath. Afraid of the claim that Jesus would make on him. What kind of a life would Peter have now? How would he need to live? What sacrifices would he need to make? You'll remember that later, actually, he's able to boast of the sacrifices he's, he's, he knows he's made. But then, again, as he does many times after opening his mouth, Peter realizes at the same time, those words probably shouldn't have come from his mouth. But they were true to the point, nonetheless. He was a follower of Jesus. Jesus perhaps overlooks it at that point when he opens his mouth to, again, uh, say something in a very human way. Because he knows how much he will endure for his name, for his sake. He knows how much good Peter will do for his church, for the founding of it nonetheless. In the Spirit, having been bestowed upon him at Pentecost. And all of this just wells up in the mind and heart. How much he's yet to sacrifice. And so Jesus' re response in this context is as typical and compassionate as it can be. Listen, don't be afraid. And I think this reveals to us how much, how much stock God puts in those who listen. And that's all he's done it. up to this point is listen to Jesus. Though it's right to call him judge, as Lord, Jesus here in this time and place has one goal in mind, to take care of sin once and for all. And he's, he's heading to the cross. He's here to make a way for Peter. 
the other apostles, disciples, and of course for you and for me. Just so, both Peter and for us, Jesus says, don't be afraid. This is the absolution, the forgiveness of sins, the purest and sweetest gospel. There is no longer anything of which to be afraid for Jesus, crucified and risen, is here for you and for me. You and I no longer need to fear suffering, pain, let alone death. The penultimate, in fact, we learned in Bible study this morning, Hannah was asking, what what does the the epitome mean? The, The conclusion. What's at the end? Not even God's wrath we need to be afraid of. All that from the fact that Jesus specifically made Peter and the other apostles his servants. Otherwise, such good news would not be ours today, not made available from the faithful preaching and passing down of these words by the grace of the Spirit. Jesus witnesses, passed these scriptures down to us. A unique word to describe God's words to the church, the church fathers, to preachers, pastors, men like Merlin Ream. May he rest in peace. And to believers, everyone who believes, people like you and me, in the knowledge that the word of God, specifically in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our salvation, lives in us today. So, dear saints, listen, rejoice, and believe. For God loves you. Do not be afraid. In the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen. And may the peace which surpasses our understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.